Well, I'm delighted to be here as part of the Science Network, and I'd like to thank Terry and uh, Roger for organizing this. It's been a wonderful meeting so far, and I've enjoyed many of the discussions this morning and earlier this afternoon. I enjoyed some of Richard Dawkins' comment, and also a lecture given by Neil, uh, which I enjoyed immensely, but there's one minor point of disagreement. Uh, I think he got something factually incorrect. And that is, he talked about the glories of the Arab civilization, about Baghdad, which I agree with wholeheartedly. But then he referred to Arabic numerals, that they invented the number system as we know it, with zero and numbers. In fact, these should be called Indian numerals. <laughs> they, they actually originated in India in the second century AD, and then were transmitted to the Arabs, and from there to the, to the West. And Western scholars therefore refer to it as, as Arabic numerals. Um, but, you know, that doesn't contradict the spirit of what you're saying, which I agree with. Now, regarding God, which is the main theme uh, of this conference, uh, I think the word is used in many different ways. Uh, on the one hand, there's the idea of a very abstract sense of, uh, what many of us scientists have, of the sense of wonder uh, we experience when contemplating the cosmos. In other words, God is synonymous with natural phenomena, uh, with the universe, if you like. And uh, this is a recurring theme in many Eastern philosoph philosophical traditions. And I can't find anything wrong with that, and I think many of you would agree. But then there's a notion of a personal God, that there's a, this guy, old man, watching us, and who punishes us for our sins and rewards us, gives us brownie points for, for um, good deeds. And that I find hard to believe, and I'm sure that most of you here would agree with that. Now, I also want to talk about, um, what I'm going to mainly talk about is the origin of religious belief. Uh, what parts of the brain are involved? Obviously, the brain is involved in religious belief, but are some parts of the brain more involved in, than other parts? And also, the evolutionary origins of re religious belief. And let me say at the outset, I don't believe in intelligent design. I believe, uh, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but essentially a random process of natural selection is what's involved in evolution. And I don't believe in intelligent design. And it's ironic that our president is, is championing this, this view of intelligent design, given that his own existence is a living negation of any such principle. <laughs> um, now, the other topic that came up repeatedly is the notion of consistency of belief. How can somebody be an eminent physicist, even logician like Kurt Gödel, uh, come to believe in, in, in something like God? So how can somebody hold inconsistent, inconsistent beliefs, even though the person may be extraordinarily intelligent? And I have a, an answer to that. I think that a consistency of belief, in fact, is the exception rather than the rule in human behavior. We have all these parallel brain mechanisms, modules, which are performing different computations. And they're approximately in coherence. And that's important, producing coherent behavior, important for survival. And that's why they, there's coherence. But Sometimes they're out of sync, and that's why you get inconsistencies in belief systems. I'm reminded of, of, of um, Niels Bohr, who had a, a, a horseshoe on his door. And somebody asked him, my God, how, do you, how can you possibly have a horseshoe? You don't believe that, that it b b brings good luck? And he said, well, I don't believe in it, but it works anyway. Okay. <laughs> now, the most flagrant, the most flagrant. He said it works even if you don't believe if you it. Now, the most flagrant example of this is seen in neurology. And we've been studying patients with a disorder called anusognosia, where a patient has a right parietal damage, stroke affecting the left side of the body, complete paralysis of the left side of the body, including the left arm. This person is quite intelligent, engages in a conversation about politics, can play chess with you, and so on and so forth. But then you say, what about your arm? Does your left arm work? And the patient says, oh, it's fine. It works fine, right? So here's a patient who's completely intelligent, denying something perfectly obvious, like the left arm being completely paralyzed. In extreme cases, you show his left arm to him or her and say, what is this? He says, oh, it's my mother's hand, or it's my father's hand. And you say, well, why do you think it's your father's hand? He says, well, it's big and hairy, so it's my father's hand. So here is somebody who is perfectly lucid and intelligent, holding this absurd belief that their left arm is not paralyzed or belongs to somebody else. In fact, I saw a patient the other day, and, and, and she said, my left arm, this arm doesn't belong to me. Uh, it's not paralyzed. It's fine. Okay. Then I said, touch your left shoulder with your right hand. And of course, there's no problem. The right hand is fine. 
And he does that. Then I said, touch your right shoulder with your left hand. And he does this. Now, that's amazing because it shows that somebody in there knows she's paralyzed. Okay. This is an absolutely striking example of inconsistency in belief. Now, you may think this person denying paralysis or denial is a very rare neurological syndrome, but not all of us here. But in fact, it's extraordinarily common. All of you here, most of you here, engage in denial all the time. But let me give you a little proof of this. Somebody recently conducted a survey asking people, everybody, are you above average or below average in intelligence? 98% of people say they are above average in intelligence. And this is mathematically impossible because it's obviously a Gaussian curve. And what it shows is half of mankind is in denial about its stupidity. <laughs> this is painfully evident in our last presidential election, by the way. OK, so uh, now let's go to get to the neurology. And one of the, th one of the group, one group of patients we have studied is split brain patients or commissurotomy patients. These are people whose corpus callosum has been cut and anterior commissure and massa intermedia whenever encountered. So essentially, you're, taking a, you're doing a karate chop right through the head and creating two human beings in one body, in one skull, two spheres of consciousness. Now, many experiments have done on, been done on these people, and I ask myself a very simple question. OK, you've created two people here. What about their personalities? Do they have different personalities? What about their aesthetic preferences? Does one like blondes and the other like brunettes, for example? One like chocolate and the other like vanilla? What, what happens? So we tried these experiments. And what we did was we had to first train the right hemisphere to communicate with us. In fact, the right hemisphere can read simple commands, simple words, simple sentences. And then you ask a question and say, point to a box, yes, no, I don't know, because it can't talk. The right hemisphere cannot talk. But it can comprehend simple semantics, simple questions. Left hemisphere, of course, can talk. So you can present boxes, yes, no, I don't know. So we asked, for example, are you at Caltech? And the right hemisphere pointed to yes. Are you on the moon? It said no. Are you, uh, uh, are you um, in California? It said yes. Are you asleep? It said no. Then I said, are you a woman? And the patient was male. And he pointed to yes, and then started chuckling and laughing. So at least the right hemisphere has a sense of humor. Okay. <laughs> OK, so now comes the big question. What if you ask, do you believe in God? So I said, do you believe in God? And the right hemisphere went straight to yes. Right? Ask the same question to the left hemisphere. Yes, no, I don't know. It went to no. Right? So here is a human being whose right hemisphere is an atheist, and left hemisphere, on the other hand, <laughs> believes in God. And this finding should have sent a tsunami through the theological community, but barely produced a ripple because it raises all kinds of profound theological questions. If this person dies, what happens? Does one hem <laughs> Does one hemisphere go to heaven and the other go to hell? I don't know the answer to that. Now, now the next group of patients we studied were patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. And it's been known for a long time, people with seizures originating in the temporal lobes, epileptic seizures. Normally, you think of epileptic seizures as being a grand mal seizure, and you have a you know, you have a seizure involving the whole body, you stop breathing, you utter a loud cry, and you fall down. But in fact, there's a group of seizures, a kind of seizure called temporal lobe seizure, or psychomotor seizure, which is purely a mental seizure, an emotional seizure, but doesn't necessarily involve a bodily seizure. And what's astonishing, there are many symptoms of this, emotional upheavals, and uh, extraordinarily emotionally loaded experiences, a turmoil of emotions that the patient experiences, but the most striking aspect of these people is not only during the seizures, but interictally, when they're not having seizures, they have extraordinarily, they have tremendous religious experiences and mystical experiences. They say things like, during the seizure, I experience God. I see the meaning of the universe, the true meaning of the universe, for the first time in my life. Everything is deeply significant. I understand my place in the cosmic scheme of things. That's what they say. And this happens also in between seizures, but primarily during seizures. Sometimes they'll actually say, I'm talking to God, or God is talking to me. Now, why does this happen? 